Uh, good morning and thank you so much for your attendance today. But before I begin, I just want to say thank you to all the partners that took part in this investigation. So with us today, we have uh, Deputy Commissioner Burnham that's here from OPP. We've got Superintendent Bond and Inspector Saliba from Peel Region Police. But there are many other agencies that we're working with us as well. Now, as I stated yesterday, we kicked in 43 doors. This is a very big and lengthy investigation. This investigation had many tentacles to it. Inspector Bott from the uh, Organized Crime Enforcement Unit will come up, and he will give the details as to the type of uh, intensity this investigation had. But one of the things that I want to mention is that this particular takedown is, is not an indication of um, this is all we do. Each and every day, I have officers that are devoted to work specifically to reduce the gunplay in the city, to specifically do investigations on street gangs. So it's not like we devote all our assets to one investigation. It is a multitude of officers that are on this on a day-to-day -day basis to do their best to try to keep the city safe. And once again, this is such a strong testament of the importance of partnerships. Policing in general has learned how to work together. And when we work together, we get to have amazing conclusions like we had today. So to the men and women from all of the agencies that had an active part in this investigation, we all did it together. It was not done in silos. And by working with that information process together, we were able to have some successful outcomes. So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce Inspector Brian Bott, and then I'll be available for some questions afterwards, and so will he. Thank you, Chief, and good morning. First, I'd like to start by saying that the Toronto Police Service is committed to public safety and undertakes as one of its service priorities, public safety and safety and uh, maintain safe communities and neighborhoods. Part of the responsibility lies with myself of the Organized Crime, and Task Organized Crime Enforcement Unit, and it's addressed by these intelligence-led investigations. Project Civil Commence was a criminal organization investigation into a gang identified as HOK, or Heart of Kings. Heart of a King, I'm sorry. The Joint Force investigation commenced in January of this year, and this focus was the target of the gang, which is currently incarcerated. This gang, through intelligence information, we know had a, a high pr propensity for violence, um, and then were involved, we believe, in several homicides within the city of Toronto. The project was led by the Toronto Police Service, more specifically the Firearms Enforcement Unit and the major project section of the Gun and Gang Task Force with support from the OPP and Peel Regional Police. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the support we received from the Montreal Police Service during this investigation. Internally, the project investigators worked closely with the Integrated Gun and Gang Task Force street teams, the Homicide Squad, the Major Crime Task Force, Financial Crimes Unit, Sex Crimes Unit, Intelligence Services, and 12 Division. By way of background, I can advise that HOK criminal organization evolved from a well-known street gang in Nova Scotia known as North Preston's Finest. This criminal organization was most active in the downtown core of Toronto, with most of their criminal activities centered around adult entertainment establishments and local bars. We allege the leader of HOK, of the organization of HOK, is Jamal Richardson, who's pictured to the right sitting on top of that Bentley. His alias is Bam or Bambino. At the, and at the front man, he's the front man for the rap crew that promotes their criminal lifestyle. Based on intelligence information we received, we believe this gang was involved in and responsible for several crimes of violence, including, but not limited to, homicides, shootings, firearms, firearms trafficking, and firearms possession. Most notably, due to the combined efforts of the investigators of Project Sizzle and the TPS Homicide Squad, the following members of HOK are currently incarcerated and facing allegations of murder. Kyle Sparks McKinnon was arrested on January 31st, the beginning of this project, in relation to a double homicide that took place on Spudine Avenue in the city of Toronto. The deceased in, in that murder are David Eminis and Quinn Taylor. There was also three innocent victims shot that day on Spudine Avenue. Stuart Douglas, Earl McLean, and Jethro Collado. Second homicide which th these members are incarcerated for um, include Jamal Richardson, the person pictured to my right, Kyle Sparks McKinnon, Mitchell Manette, Des Des Denzel Desmond, who were all arrested uh, early May as a result of a combined effort into the, as a result of, sorry, <laughs> arrested for the uh, murder of Charles Schillingford, which was homicide 41 for 15, which I believe Staff Inspector McLean released uh, earlier this month. We also allege that this criminal organization and its associates are involved in offenses of drug trafficking, 
fraud and prostitution, which supports their lifestyle. Prior to yesterday's enforcement action, I can advise that 21 people had been arrested and 39 search warrants had been executed. With respect to the enforcement action that took place yesterday, I can advise that the search warrants were executed with the help and support of tactical teams from RCMP, OPP, Peel Regional Police, Durham Regional Police, York Regional Police, Guelph Police, Barry Police, Waterloo, Peterborough, and South Simcoe. I can advise that the search warrants were conducted in the following jurisdictions, Toronto, Peel, Halton, Durham, and Montreal, Quebec. The enforcement action yesterday resulted in the following. 43 search warrants were executed. 11 search warrants were executed on vehicles. 32 persons were, be were arrested. Yesterday's efforts were a combined effort of 600 plus police officers. The investigation to date, as a result, there has been 53 persons that have been arrested to date. 40 of those people are currently charged and before the courts, resulting in 285 charges. A detailed list of, of the accused and the charges and the offenses we allege they have committed will be available through corporate communications following the press conference. A total of 81 search warrants have been executed as a result of this project. As far as seizures, um, in front of us here we have 17 firearms that were seized as part of the investigation, including one airsoft gun, a quantity of drugs, marijuana, cocaine, ketamine, uh, two sets of body armor, a baklava, multiple drug scales, a gun box, and some jewelry, which is off to my right. Um, we have seized approximately $45,000 in Canadian currency, $300,000 estimated in uh, property-related proceeds. As I'm sure you can appreciate, there are currently several cases before the courts as a result of Project Sizzle, and despite our investigative efforts made on or prior to today's date, the investigation will continue and further charges are anticipated. For that reason, I'm not in a position to comment on the investigation specifically, but I can tell you that HOK has significantly impact, been impacted by these investigative efforts and many members of the group and many members of the, and the associates will be prosecuted under the criminal organization legislation and other substantive offenses. I thank you for coming. Chief, do you have questions? Any, any questions? Can you say how many of your arrests are actually members of HOK? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be accurate. Do you believe all of them to be there? No, associates and or associates. So all of them? Yes. yes, yes. Chief, this is a pretty impressive uh, bus you have that's gone down here. You involved all these uh, great organizations doing it. We see the firepower that these gangs are carrying that they have out in the street, and they let it go out on our streets. Uh, were any officers injured? Did you use tactical teams from different places in these state towns, or how did they go? To maximize safety, we, we do use uh, tactical uh, officers. They're the best uh, asset to use when you know that you're going to be executing search warrants and the propensity for violence could occur or the uh, possibility of firearms do exist. And if we have that information in advance, and that would be the response. And uh, the, the takedowns went down very successfully. Uh, there, were, there were no uh, serious injuries of any kind. And, and that, that goes to show that... Uh, we collectively have learned how to improve on our tactics when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, the street gangs that we uh, deal with. Chief, I know it's not something you can necessarily quantify with <coughs> but you can talk about how many of those taken in as part of this investigation have been arrested before, been through the system before? Well, I, I, I really don't want to get into that. I think what the important piece here is that we've been able to eradicate an organization that uses this as their tools for doing business. That says a very loud statement. On the go forward, we are still actively investigating other street gangs that we have in the city to try our very best to keep the city safe. Can you tell us where they were active mostly, like what neighborhoods, what parts of town they were? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, good question. Mostly downtown, but uh, it's, it's also safe to say, Christy, that wherever they were, <laughs> there's a propensity for violence. Uh, the Spadina uh, shooting, a classic example, where two people were murdered and, and three uh, innocent bystanders were hit. That's the type of uh, uh, entity that we're dealing with that we've removed from the streets right now, and hopefully now through prosecutions, we'll be able to uh, uh, incarcerate them for quite a long period of time since we've added the organized crime uh, fence to it. 
You use the word eradicate uh, for the gang. How confident are you that you captured them all? Well, I'm never overly confident. I'm always looking at what the intelligence tells us, what informants tells us, what agents tell us with respect to what street uh, gang activities are taking uh, uh, effect in the city of Toronto. And uh, whenever we get that information, we utilize it. So I'm not going to be uh, overly confident, uh, but I'm very confident that I have amazing investigators. I'm very confident that we work in partnerships with these other organizations. We're much better at it now than we were before. And, and uh, if we find people that, uh, that uh, subscribe to this type of lifestyle, uh, we will apprehend you. Were the two cases of murder that you referred to earlier that these uh, arrests are linked to, was that because of a fight between this gang and another gang? Well, that, we're going to save that for the courtroom. We're not going to get into motives or things on those lines. Uh, there's a court case ahead, and we anticipate to, develop, to, to divulge the information then. Can you elaborate on HOK's history? How long have they been operating in Toronto, and what exactly is their connection to North Preston's violence? Um, the information we, we have is that they've been in, in Toronto uh, since 2010. Um, their connection to North Preston's finest is most of the people that are before the courts, the main players from HOK, um, originate from Halifax. Does that and, and have family ties, yes, have family ties to North Preston's finest. And his name again is Jamal Richardson. That's correct. You mentioned two homicides that you believe are tied to this gang. Any other homicides that you're investigating as potential links? I mean, those are ongoing homicide investigations and investigations being conducted by my unit. I don't really want to comment on those at this point. But there could be more? You, you described that, I think, as intelligence-led policing, and I'm wondering if there was any impact on the changes to the carding procedure in Toronto or if the, if the force of the service, excuse me, has found new ways to sort of do intelligence-led policing. Well, you know, p policing, policing isn't really new. It goes back to 1829 with Sir Robert Peel and his nine elements, and we still utilize those. But I, I, I will say, uh, with the advancement of technology, it does allow for faster distribution of information. It does give us more accurate accounts of what we're looking for in a timely fashion. And it allows us to streamline the information that we have. We're able to then convert it into products which allow us to uh, have a starting point for investigations such as this. And, um, and we have successful outcomes. How many of the arrests took place here in Toronto and how many took place in uh, Montreal? During the arrests were here in Toronto, four arrests were in Montreal. Can you elaborate on the link to Montreal? Were those people, did they live in Montreal or were they just there? Were um, they setting up? I think that's all part of the investigation. I don't really want to go into that. <coughs> and was there any arrests or were there any arrests in Halifax? Or there was not. Why? So, oh, sorry. Why is it called Operation Sizzle? That's a good question. I'm not sure my investigators could give me an answer. <laughs> Inspector, I think when, when it was brought in, that, that painting up there sort of generated a, a lot of attention. Is, is, is that trophies like that, or, or I guess, I don't know how you would classify that, but is that something that you see often in your investigations? It's like the first that? time I've seen one like that. <laughs> Where was it? From whom, who, whose place was it seized? We laid that's associated to Jamal Richardson and an address associated to him. Is, is there some sort of symbolism in that picture that relates to the HOK? Or? I, I suggest that that might symbolize what he thinks of himself and his lifestyle. Are there any symbols that are associated with HOK? Tattoos or markings or anything like that? The only ones that we've been able to identify so far is a simple HOK. Chief, could you speak to something about the great work of all the forensics people who are doing work on this? It seems they've been working overtime with the homicides and guns, the gangs, and getting all this. And are these guns going to be tested to look for other murders and that sort of thing? Yes, this gives us an opportunity now to, uh, to thoroughly investigate these. And, and a lot of investigations don't just rely on witnesses, but also through other uh, aspects of uh, evidence, such as uh, forensics. And this is a case where all of these weapons will be tested thoroughly to see if there are any associations, and also to see if there's potential as to how they got in here. And then we can start continuing other investigations. And with these investigations, what tends to happen when, when arrests are made, especially in, in this volume, 
it, uh, it creates a, a bit of a vacuum effect, but it also provides an opportunity for uh, an information vacuum, where now that certain people that pose danger are apprehended, it gives us an opportunity where people may feel safe now to say, you know what, I knew this information, I'm willing to give it to you now that I feel uh, safe and here it is. So. The, the investigation really is not over yet. It, it, it could potentially be just the beginning of something even better. You mentioned a couple of weeks ago how worried you were about the number of guns on the streets right now, mm -hmm. the escalation. Can you give us an update on the amount of gunplay that we're seeing this summer and how concerned you are heading into the warmer months? Well, the, the, the summer ha has not started yet. We, we had a, a very busy start this year. This year was a very busy start. Um, and uh, we have had uh, uh, our, our investigators and our officers, our primary response, our community response, going into communities. Uh, we've had a look at where the crime uh, spikes have been happening, and we've put people in those places to help the reduction piece. Um, and I, I really think that uh, this summer is a summer where we will take a very strong look at what we need to do to improve on keeping, keeping our city safe. Um, I, I really do think that uh, this is a good starting point. This is a good starting point, and uh, there are guns out there, but I've got some of the best investigators, and, and uh, every day we're arresting uh, and, and uh, getting people with firearms. We, to date, we've now seized 367 firearms. We've taken that many firearms off the street, so our officers aren't sitting on our hands. They're busy on a daily basis uh, fighting the fight. Do, uh, does this gang relate in any way to the shooting of Candace Bob? Um, the Candace Bob investigation is still ongoing, and the officers, the investigators, are looking at every single active lead that they have, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Can I ask what you want to say as well? Uh, Nathan Lee? You're asking a lot of questions today. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Nathan Lee, is there a connection with this gang to, to that shooting? Did you know well, what, what we're doing is we follow the evidence. So if our investigators see links, if they see correlations, then that will determine whether or not the, the answer to that question is, is yes or no. Uh, the investigation is still ongoing. That, that video, I think, is very clean, very clear. There is no doubt in my mind that there are people out there that know exactly who they are. All we need is a name of that second person, uh, Shamari White. We know him, and we know that he is wanted, and he is armed and dangerous. And the fact that we haven't found him yet tells me to believe that someone's probably helping him. And if we find out who that person is, they too will be incarcerated. So we still do need help in identifying who the other person is. And we're asking both of them to turn themselves in with the lawyers because it's a matter of time. He will be identified and, and he will be uh, put before the judicial system. I noticed that there's some deaths here as part of the evidence. <coughs> is that something that's commonly found when you do these kinds of raids, or does this speak to the kind of violence that this gang is? Well, it, it, it's, it speaks to what tools that this gang uses for their day-to-day -day business. And in, in, involved in that, you have um, bulletproof vests. And uh, we see bulletproof vests uh, in the street gang subculture uh, because they live a lifestyle where they fear being shot. And so they will have vests. And this is just another case where we've got vests and guns and drugs. And that necklace there is worth, I believe, six digits. I'm not sure what the actual price is. But uh, th these types of lifestyles are always short-lived. I've never seen longevity in people that uh, invest in uh, street gang activity uh, to be successful, like in their movie videos and, and all those things. No one has ever ran like, the gauntlet and been successful at the end. It always leads to this. The investigation is early, and one of the things that we will naturally do is find out the source, where is it coming from, and, and, uh, and see if that leads us into something else that we need to further explore. Chief, can you talk about the role of police of deterring young people from getting involved in this kind of activity in the first place, besides just busts like this? Yeah, you, the, and I stated this yesterday, you know, enforcement and policing is only one element of community safety. Um, we, we do so much on a daily basis to try to uh, apprehend those that have decided to use firearms as a, a means to, uh, to an end. Uh, however, we, we still need to work with other agencies to, to make our community safer. You know, other than the enforcement piece, we've got the hub processes across the city right now that look for uh, putting the right agency in the right place at the right time instead of the 
apprehension piece. We've looked at, uh, we're working collectively on um, court diversion so that uh, young men and women don't have to go through the judicial system the first time they make the mistake. And we're looking at developing stronger partnerships with other agencies to see if uh, young men, and, and especially in, in the neighborhoods that need resources, uh, have more tools to make better decisions. This is not a good decision. So, you know, the success story, this is kind of a success story that we've uh, apprehended these people and we've got all these firearms. A greater success story is that when that person has to make the decision of using a gun or not using a gun, they decide not to use a gun. Do you worry, though, that putting all this on the table might be interpreted as sort of police flexing their muscles and an act of animosity towards, towards some of these street gangs? <laughs> um, if you're trying to diminish the success story, it won't work. There are a lot of officers that put a lot of resources out there. As a result, they were able to remove these guns off the street. Today is a good day for policing. The ability, we had strong partnerships and collectively we have done this. I think it's a very positive day. So uh, I, I wouldn't categorize your comments uh, to be accurate. Chief, in working with all these other departments, you did some great work on this with you. We've seen some great investigations that have gone forward on different things like the, the murders where all agencies work together using major case management systems. Is that the sort of system you use during this or is there some other uh, facility you have to work together as agencies? We've, we've learned uh, through history how we can work better as partnerships through many different uh, uh, mediums. You know, globalization is making the world a lot smaller now, so we don't sit in silos anymore. We, we've learned the importance of the criminal element doesn't think in silos, and so now we've adapted that same principle. And so we meet on a regular basis and we look at patterns, trends, and issues that we can do to work collectively to uh, try to keep all of our communities safe.